if they've gone out and they've made all this progress, they're real happy. They go, go, go. They're growing, growing, growing. Boink. They hit this plateau. Wrong sport. Not a tennis player. Go play this boink, racquetball. All of a sudden, working hard, not getting the result. Wrong thing. Wrong relationship. Wrong job. Wrong mission. So then they go out and play golf and they go, boom. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even get the progress. <laughs> and they go, I didn't need to use the F word that many more times in my life, right? You know, different piece. Now that's what a dabbler does. And by the way, dabblers by their nature are unhappy. Think about this. Even with all the economic challenges that exist, most people in North America for sure have a better quality of life than 95% of the planet. 95% of the planet is living on what? How much? Two thirds of the planet, I should say, is living on $2 a day. Your worst nightmare is somebody else's greatest dream. Most of the planet's greatest dream. Your idea of economic downfall is somebody's dream. That's the truth. And so what happens though is, would you agree we have more choices, more freedoms, more opportunities today than any time in human history, yes or no? Are most people's happy, is their happiness tied to the quality of life they really have? Because we're a world now that's shallow. Most people are dabblers. They try something for a while, it doesn't work out, they do something else. Now you wouldn't be in this room for five days if you were a dabbler, but how many of you got to deal with some of these dabblers out there? Say I. Dabblers are the people you want to make sure you keep off your team or get off quickly because they're going to quit anyway. And the time, energy, and effort it takes to train a dabbler has the same energy you could have a platinum player. And we're going to show you some ways to do that later on. But let me show you another path for a second before we show you the rest of the training effect. Let's take the path of what I call a stressor. Here's the stressor's philosophy. I find the way. Who can relate to this? Say I. I'm going to find the way. I'm going to cheat it. So they take up a sport like tennis, and it goes like this, and they're doing really, really well, it's going really good, but eventually, boink, they hit a plateau. Here's the difference. Does the stressor quit? Ever quit, yes or no? Absolutely not. What does the stressor do when it doesn't work out? What do they do? Do they settle for it? What if they actually get a little worse for a short time? What happens? They really get stressed when they go, oh, screw this, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to break through, I'm going to learn a book, I'm going to find something, I'm going to get a coach, I'm going to make this thing happen, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to find whatever it takes to make this thing happen. And they break through, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, they break through, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, they break through and all of a sudden they start making progress and progress and they're so happy and all of a sudden, guess what happens? Boink. And they go, damn. How the hell, well, how could that happen? I've been working my tail off. I just had this breakthrough. I just worked through this thing. I just fought through it. But by the way, do they hit another plateau? Yes or no? So... What happens here? Do they give up? Do they quit? Do they go to the wrong sport? What does the stressor do? They stress out. Shit, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to make this thing happen. Come on, figure something out. Let's find this thing. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make more calls. I'm going to make this thing happen. And all of a sudden, eventually, what happens? Boom! Ladies and gentlemen, they break through again. Come on now. And by the way, they eventually get where they want to be. The problem is, they're so stressed out. By the time they get there, they're so exhausted, they can't enjoy it. The human brain has this incredible capacity for guilt. And most people unconsciously let that roll over them and kick their butt and make a horrible life. I love guilt. Guilt is a tool. Guilt is a weapon. Guilt does not have to be a bad thing. It's not like I perpetuate, but I'm like, I love that I feel bad when I don't do a good job. Most people hate that about themselves. I love that feeling. I'm like, I didn't do a good job there. Next time I will. So some people, guilt is discouragement. Other people, it's a signal for learning. To me, guilt is a signal for learning. It is the body and the brain, the spirit, knowing what is right, knowing what is wrong, knowing what's great, knowing what's mediocre. And it's saying, hey, do a little better. Now, if it's translated into a negative impulse, then some people call it guilt. But I'm like, I'm totally cool with guilt. I, you know, I think it's good that we feel bad when we do something that is below our standard or that's not right, because that impulse to go, I want to do that better. 
The way I see it is that competition in and of itself is not good or bad. And, and this is like the monk mindset on, on 99% of things, that this mug is not good or bad. It can be filled with water or it could be filled with poison. Yes. And so competition, I'll give you an example. Yeah. As monks, our competition is in how much love and respect we show to each other. That's your competition? Like that's what you compete on. Or how, so, how long can we meditate for? No, no, no. <laughs> I can so meditate longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him. He's scratching his back. He got uh, out like that. Moved. If your meditation just got destroyed, <laughs> all the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. They focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. But, but you compete for showing respect. You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, yes. I, I feel like you have no, this. I didn't you're, used to do that. Yeah. For the last but you did it now. Like, you think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and each support other. each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that. And, and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use, and this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset. You can use any, <laughs> I can so meditate longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him. He's scratching his back. He got uh, out like that. Moved. Your meditation just got destroyed, <laughs> all the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. They focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. But, but you compete for showing respect. You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, I, yes. I feel like you have no, this. I didn't you're used to do that. Yeah. For the last but you did it now. Like, you think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and support each other. Each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that. And, and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use, and this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset. You can use any. Yeah thing in a positive way. One thing that's true about life is that things are always changing around you, always. Whether you are moving into a new season or in, in school and all of a sudden your kids' school schedules change or you're moving into a new season of work and all of a sudden your work life is changing or you're moving into a new season of your marriage or of your health or of anything. Life changes all the time, which is why it's really important to be self-aware and to make the small changes that help you enjoy and seize all the opportunities from the season of life, work, family, relationships that you're in right now. We always have been trained to focus on the results. So people ask, what do you want in life? And I'm like, forget that. That's the worst question to ask someone. Because when you ask what you want, that's when the ads come in and you're like, oh, I want that car. I want that home. I want that dress. I want that body. I want whatever it is. I, my question to is, what do you want to wake up and be every day? Like, what do you want to wake up and do every day? What's the process that yeah. you're in love with? So we're thinking about the result, whereas my question is, forget the result. What's the process that you're in love with doing? So start there, first of all. Don't start your journey of saying, I want to be a movie director because I want to, you know, I want to hit the blockbuster charts. I want to do this. Don't make it about that. Like, don't, don't be like, I want to be a singer because I want to be Ariana Grande, right? Like, that's not the point. That's just a result. Do you love singing every day? And I realized this with a very honest question to myself. I'm really passionate about football, soccer. I absolutely love the game. I grew up on it. I'm still a huge fan. I missed out on it when I was a monk. I've been catching up ever since. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, I, any football game. I was just in London last week and I made sure I went. I didn't, couldn't see a game live, but I went and watched it at a, at a bar in London. And I love the energy. I'm so passionate about soccer. I don't have what it takes to be a soccer player. Yeah. Like, I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I wake up at 4 a.m. to meditate. When I was a monk, I wake up at six, uh, 5.30 a.m. now to meditate. I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. to go out on a raining pitch and play soccer. 
Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to be in the gym for four hours a day. I want to meditate for four hours a day, but I don't want to uh, play soccer for four hours a day and then be in the gym and train. I'm not envious of any athlete in the world because it takes a different type of mindset. If you had a kid, obviously you do have a kid, but say if you had like a 20 year old and he's just a doper or he wake and bakes and doesn't get anything done. He's just always like hanging out with his friends and playing video games and he's just a loser. I, I, I wish there was a way you could show someone like that. Like, I know that you're getting some comfort and satisfaction out of just laying around, doing nothing, eating, getting fat. But your life would feel better and richer if you had a goal. You chase that goal, you accomplish some things, and you would get this boost of confidence, you'd get this boost of self-esteem, like whatever it is that you're into doing. Maybe you're into drawing comic books. Maybe yeah. you're into nah, but making pottery or sculptures or who but find whatever the f that is and pursue that instead of doing nothing like the people that are doing nothing those are the real people I mean, look m doing something might be as simple as like that alex honnold guy he just climbs rocks but he's world-class rock climber though. it's something but and it's also a goal of his, of yeah. his and he's also the best at it right? yes yeah but those those people who smoke pot all day and do that, those are also the guys who hate on Joe Rogan for being in shape. You know what I'm saying? Or being disciplined or get on Kevin Hart's Instagram and hate on, you know what I'm saying? Because they don't, it, it's their own insecurities. I see what you're saying, but I, I would assume they would get motivated by seeing other people do something with their lives. Like that should be motivating, not... Yeah, but if you grew up, if you grew up with losers and you're around a bunch of people with shitty attitudes, especially if it's in your household, <clears throat> I was very lucky that uh, both my mom and my stepdad, they're not, they're not, they're the least hater people I've ever met in my life. They're just not haters in any way. Like if someone's doing well, they're always like, wow, look at this guy. Or like, wow, look at her. Yeah, or, wow, celebrate. look at him. There was never any hate in my house in terms of, uh, other people's success but if you grew up with a dad and your dad's like yeah these all these rich assholes this he thinks she's a badass and this you know these people that look at other people's success and instead of saying wow that guy did a lot of work like the way i'm a successful person but the way i look at kevin hart he exhausts me you know or the rock those guys exhaust me i'm like jesus christ like i feel lazy next to those guys like they do so much like those guys are so overbearingly ambitious you know but some people they see that and they compare themselves and they don't like it so they get started getting really shit. and it's like a natural feeling to try to chip away at that person I believe in human possibility, human potential, and I think that one of our biggest limiting beliefs is the belief of how limited we really are. And so my interest is to give people the science to begin to understand how powerful they really are. And I think that science really is the language that does that really well. And, and the new sciences like quantum physics and uh, neuroplasticity, neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, you know, uh, psycho neuroimmunology, the mind body connection, epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibilities. So I want to create a language for people from a philosophical or theoretical standpoint for them to begin to understand what's possible. But then I want to be able to have those people begin to wire that information in their brain completely because learning is making new connections right in the brain. But remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections and it's so much easier to lose our vision than to remember it, right? So then we have to begin to hardwire the brain or install the neurological hardware in preparation for an experience. So the more people understand what they're doing and why, then the how gets easier. So I wanna then set up the conditions in an environment, in a, in a, in a workshop where people can begin to apply or personalize what they learn so that they can have an experience and experience then further enriches the brain but the prize of an experience is an emotion
And once you start feeling unlimited, once you start feeling abundant, once you start feeling worthy, now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So knowledge is for the mind and experiences for the body and people begin to embody the truth that philosophy now if they can repeat it over and over again it'll become innate in them and become natural second nature will become easy to begin to master that philosophy so i want people to begin to understand that thoughts are very powerful feelings drive our thoughts and that they can begin to create a better life for themselves once they understand some of these principles what's a few simple things that they should be doing right now to have a checklist to do before the end of the year to then crush for a whole 12 months moving forward. All right. I'm going to give you something called the ladder of personal finance, which tells you where your money should go. Okay. This is just step by step. Put your money here. And if you want to know all the details about it, you can check out the system. So it's in the book too. The, the, it's yeah. in great detail in the book. Got it. All right. So, if you've got some money lying around, what should you do with it? First of all, if you've got a 401k match at work, you should max that out. That's free money. Take advantage of it. And if you're not sure what that means, go to your HR person and say, does this company match any 401k contributions? If they say yes, do what I said. Uh, next, if you've got debt, pay it off. Pay it off aggressively. You know, what's interesting is that most people in debt who I talk to don't actually know how much they owe. And that's shocking. You would think, of course they would know. No, they don't. Because who wants to proactively- Stare at their debt all day. Yeah, and just feel bad about it. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? You feel much better when you have a plan. And the number one question I ask folks uh, when they tell me they have debt, I say, number one, do you know how much you owe? They never do. Number two, for the rare people who say, you know, 15,000 or 70,000, whatever, I say, what is your debt payoff date? You can actually Ooh. plug it in. You can pay, uh, plug in a debt, payoff calculator online. You can map it all out and you will be able to know the exact month your debt will be paid off. Based on how much you're spending right now. On Based it. on how much you're contributing to that debt payoff. Now you will be able to see that if you add an extra 50 bucks a month or hundred bucks a month, that thing will actually oftentimes shorten by years because of the interest. It doesn't matter if it's going to take you three months or four years to pay off your debt. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that you know the date. Okay, so that's number two, pay off any debt you've got. Three, if you've got money left over, uh, go to your Roth IRA. And if you can, max that out. That's a great tax advantage to count. It's a gross so, tax deferred, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, um, uh, so that's three. That's three. Okay. It's actually post-tax money. And then four, if you still got money, you're going to go to back to your 401k, which is uh, another tax advantage to count. You're going to max that out. If you still got money, you're going to create a non-taxable, non-retirement account and just put your money in there. Now, there's a few other wrinkles to this. There's HSAs available. There's also your emergency fund that's talked about in the book and all these things. They're details. But that just shows you when you've got money, this is where you go. There's a structured way of thinking about it. A ladder towards a ladder. financial success. Exactly. And if you follow the steps, it's almost like the like a waterfall. It just goes from step one to step two to step three. And your money's going where it needs to go automatically. And you will feel great. You'll feel great, which is so important. And also, you're going to look at your accounts and see debt's going down. Investment and savings are going up. And all of a sudden, you wake up six months from now, and you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize I have that much saved in my savings account. That's because of the decision you made today. Mm. Here's how to really cash in on this year. Number one, get serious. Life is serious. We call it life or death. Somebody asked me one time if I had a good description of life. I said, yes, I think I've got a good one. Life is the struggle to keep death at a respectable distance. Right? Death seems to want to move in prematurely, prematurely. If you want to live a good, long, flourishing life, you've got to push back. You can't just give in, you got to push back. And we're dealing with some serious matters here. 
So we can't just, you know, tell the latest 10 jokes and just go home. We're not here to entertain. We're here to instruct. We're here to grow. We're here to learn. We're here to get the best we possibly can. Serious. Life is serious. The future is serious. One ancient novelist said, these are the best of times and these are the worst of times. And for some of those who came across this platform at the extravaganza of million dollar a year incomes, for them it's the best of times. But I want you to know that while they're getting the diamonds and the millions, there are a lot of people around the world, for them it is the worst of times. The best of times and the worst of times. That's called serious man. How come such a difference from those who can reach such incredible heights and those who haven't yet found the answers for their life, their health, and their future? We just have to ponder that and let that give us a note of seriousness. A note of seriousness. It's serious whether you win or lose. It's serious whether you succeed or fail. It's serious whether you've got a good future carved out for yourself or you do not. These are serious matters. Matters of the heart are serious. Matters of income are serious. Matters of supporting your family, serious. Are you serious? Why? We've got a serious matter here to discuss. We haven't come with the latest tent stories. We've come with a serious matter. And I want you to take on that serious tone. You've got some serious products that answer a serious need out there in the marketplace. And I'm asking you to take it serious. Take your own future serious. What you can do for your family, take it serious. Here's number two, get smart. At the, that's what these journals are for. That's what pad and pencil's for. That's what taking notes is for. See if you can't increase your ability to comprehend ideas, information that can be life transforming. Don't miss the opportunity to learn. Take a good key phrase home, use it in your training. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be casual in learning. Get smart. Here's a couple of parts to it. Number one, your own personal experience. Right? If you've had a bad week, just sit down and ponder that for a while. Study it. See if you can't pick up some ideas from a poor week and then make a better week. Okay. Learn from your own experiences. One way to learn to do it right is do it wrong. And you know, that's one way to learn to do it right. Do it wrong. Now the key is don't let it take too long. <laughs> If you've done it wrong for a year, we suggest that's long enough. You don't need another year just to prove a point. No, one year is enough. Learn from your own experience, right? The possibility for life change starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up the ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of life change. Some people want to start with motivation. You don't start with motivation. So if you just motivate this guy, he'll be all right. The answer is no, probably not. If the guy's an idiot, motivate him. Now you've got a motivated idiot. So education, get smart. Don't miss the training class. You say, well, I've already been to one of those classes. I've already heard it. Got a good phrase for you to take home. That's no sign you got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time, there's no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning. Study, learn, grow, change, develop. Never let it be said you didn't learn. Right? If you want to solve your problems, you've got to learn. If you want to take advantage of an opportunity, you've got to learn. Here's number three. Get going. You got to get going. You got to take action. The disciplines is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going as far as disciplines are concerned. Number one, do what you can. You might go home and set a whole new pace for yourself. And we call it cleaning up neglect. 
Should walk around the block, could walk around the block for your good health. Don't walk around the block. See, you're on the wrong track. Should read, could read, don't read on the wrong track. Should call, could call, don't call on the wrong track. Could change, should change, don't change. You're on the wrong track. Letters you haven't written, conversations you haven't had with your family, somebody you should sit down with when you get back home, get that job done. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Go back and do what you can. And if you'll do what you can, then life will give you some extraordinary things to do. We all pity the man, right? Wants to stride out of his house, go straighten out the corporation, has not yet straightened out his garage. You gotta take care of the small disciplines before life will give you a chance to handle the more complicated disciplines. Do not disregard the smallest of disciplines. Let us not neglect, do not neglect the smallest of disciplines and build on that foundation and you can have everything you could possibly want. Okay, get going. Here's number four, get better. There isn't any of us that can't get better. So turn on this whole idea of personal development and personal growth. That was what my teacher shared with me that changed my life. I'm telling you, for things to get better, you got to get better. Don't ask for it to change out there. Ask for you to change here. Don't ask for a more favorable wind. We call that naive. Don't ask for better seed, better soil. This is the only planet you got. Just ask that you can get wiser and stronger and better. Be able to take care of your own responsibilities. Get better. Just make a list of that trio of words. Wiser, stronger, better. Go home smarter than you came. Go home with more ideas than you came. Next. Get stronger. You can develop the muscle. You can develop the courage muscle. You can develop the inspiration muscle. You can develop the dedication muscle. You can get stronger. There isn't anybody here that can't get stronger. Next time we see you, may not even recognize you. How strong you're going to be able to become in language, style, personality, the ability to cope, the ability to handle with anything that happens, no matter what happens. That the third one is get better. We can all get better. I've gotten better. First talk I gave, I stood up. My mind sat back down. And here's the secret to my success. I stood up and did it again. I stood up and I did it again. And I did it again and I did it again all those many years ago. I did it when I was scared and I did it when I didn't want to and I did it when I was ill. And I did it when it didn't work well, and I didn't did it when they didn't appreciate it, and I didn't a lot of times when I didn't know much what I was doing. I just did it anyway. And now all these years later, I'm asked to walk on this stage with the greatest introduction I've ever had, the greatest response and welcome I've ever had, the greatest opportunity I've ever had to touch this many lives with a mixture of words and heart and soul. I got better. I got better day by day and week by week and month by month and I'm asking you to do the same thing until you can develop a long arm and a long reach until you can develop influence that won't quit touch people next year you couldn't touch this year touch people now you couldn't touch before conduct a meeting now you couldn't conduct before heart and soul now mixed in there that wasn't there missing before I'm asking all of you to get better in spite of the winters in spite of the downturn the money downturn, the social downturn, the personal downturn, whatever it is. Just get stronger. Get better. I want you to understand little things matter. And until you understand that little things matter, you will never be able to fulfill your destiny. You got to take care of the small disciplines before life will give you a chance to handle the more complicated disciplines. If you start first with the smallest of disciplines and do not neglect them and do not disregard them as being trifling. Everything matters. Everything's important. 
great people do little things with excellence. In fact, it is a sure sign that you're going to end up in a great place when you give great detail to little things. When something little goes wrong and it bothers you. When you want to make sure that everything is right, even though you don't have a title and you don't have a position and you don't have recognition, but you have a standard to which you hold yourself to. Excellence doesn't start when the lights come on. Excellence doesn't start when the crowd gathers. Excellence is nurtured in mediocrity. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Do what you can. And if you'll do what you can, then life will give you some extraordinary things to do. I don't know who I'm talking to out there, but God is grooming you for greatness. If you cannot manage the little things, you'll never be able to manage the big things. If the little things overwhelm you, if you complain and collapse about little things, you'll never be ready for the greater things that God is about to do in your life. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. If you hadn't thought of it before, here it is. Everything affects everything else. It's so easy to be casual and say, well, this doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, everything matters. Because whenever God's getting ready to do great things in your life, He tests you on small things. Go for the disciplines, the smallest of disciplines, like keeping your accounts in order. Did you ever hear this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? But here's the key. If you'll be disciplined when the amounts are small, we'll make you a ruler give you a position of authority when the amounts are many. Until you are faithful over a few, you can't be faithful over many. Take care of your disciplines when the amounts are small, and then life will see to it that you get some extraordinary numbers to work with. Let us not neglect, do not neglect the smallest of disciplines, and build on that foundation, and you can have everything you could possibly want. And when the big thing comes, you're going to be amazing. Until then, you're just lazy and slowful and laid back and taking it easy. And you don't understand it is how you handle the little things that determines what's coming next in your life. In spite of how small it looks right now, it's bigger than you think. In spite of how small you look right now, it's bigger than you think. That's why you got to rejoice when you've been afflicted. Rejoice when you've been up under attack. Because God's got you in training camp. Oh, you're in the boot camp of greatness. Because you're bigger than you think and you don't even know it. Shatter your perspectives and your attitude. Shatter how you define greatness. Shatter how you define responsibility. I'm exposing you to pressure because I'm building up your tolerance because where I'm getting ready to take you, what was preciousome is gonna become your normal. And I gotta recalibrate you and train the way you think. Today, today, today is an opportunity for you to get your head right. Today, people ignore the performance of little things waiting on the next big thing. But the next big thing is a little thing. That's why you're not ready to be great until you think everything is important. Until everything matters to you. Just showing up for the battle is half the battle. Just showing up, just being in your place, just being where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there is half the battle. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the solutions. You don't have to have the favor of the army. Just show up. And just because it starts out small does not mean that it ends up small. Everything that's happening to you is God is processing you. Every difficult moment you're having, He just processing you. Everything you're going through is preparing you for what you ask God for. And if you need to be tough, when you get to where you're going, then He gonna toughen you. He gonna let you have some trials come your way that's gonna have to produce that in you. 
to really understand the value of money, I had none. To just appreciate simple things, what I'm going to eat today, where I'm going to wash up at, where I'm going to bathe. He sent me through a trial of being homeless for three years. I lived in a car for three years. All of that that I did not appreciate or understand, I understand it now. It was the route I had to go on. Everything you're going through is preparing you for what you ask God for. You just got to quit tripping while you're in the process because the process is necessary. You may not see it now, but when he gets you on the other side of it, you're going to see exactly why it went that way. And you're going to be okay with it. But quit tripping during the process. See, the route you on right now is the route you got to take. This thing you're going through, you just got to understand you ain't the only one. Oh, Lord, why me? You ain't the only one. Oh, Lord, why me? You ain't the only one. Oh, Lord, why I lose my job? You ain't the only one unemployed. Oh, Lord, why he leave me? You ain't the first chick got left. This might not even be your last time getting left. Pull yourself together and quit tripping because you in the process. God is processing you. He ain't through with you. If he was through with you, you would not wake up in the morning. He going to fix it. I look back on my life at all that I've been through. So the stuff I'm currently going through, I have built up enough reservoir that living in the car taught me that this ain't it. So the things I'm going through now, I know this ain't it. That he gonna come get me in a minute. So all I gotta do is sit tight. I ain't in a bad place. Now I ain't where I wanna be, but the spot I'm in is better than where I was. I ain't homeless. People think when you get famous or rich that your problems is over. They got a whole new set of them for you. They got some stuff you ain't seen. But I'll tell you the truth right now. The problems I got right now, I take them. Because the problems I had when I was homeless, I don't want them no more. See, money gonna change your life a little bit, folks. But you gotta ask for it. You have not because you ask not. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. It didn't say you have not because you don't make enough. It simply say you have not because you ask not. But you don't ask because you ain't got that together. When you ask God for something, quit tripping. Well, Lord, if I could just stay with him a little bit longer, maybe you don't need him. Well, I don't want to leave him because I've been with him eight years. Well, hold up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You want eight more years of this? God can't give you what you want because you want to hold on to what you got. You all in the way. Now you telling him how to bless you. You can't tell God how to bless you.
I remember when I was stuck in anger for a long time. When I made a commitment to my adopted mother that I was going to purchase her a home. I'll never forget the experience of working real hard to get the money for the down payment. Someone had told me of a beautiful home in an exclusive area of Miami. Went to see it, took my mother there, and she said, yes, I want it. It was on the water. We went to the closing. My attorney said, Les, have you had a title search? I said, what's a title search? Well, we just take a couple of days to check it out and make sure there are no liens against the property that you might have to pay if you buy this home. The guy who was there selling me the house, he said, listen, he said, the only reason that I'm selling you this house and selling it at a law is because I admire the fact that you want to purchase this house for your mother. I have another guy who will give me substantially more money, but I like it. And I've got to get back to Philadelphia. Now, if we cannot consummate this deal now, then the deal is off. I said, there are no liens against the property? He says, no, of course not. I looked at my attorney. I said, I believe him. I'll sign. She said, Mr. Brown, I'm not questioning his honesty. She said, but business is business. I signed that contract. And we had a big celebration. Everybody in the neighborhood was talking about Leslie coming home. One of the twins that Mamie adopted to buy her home. Child, isn't that nice? God is going to bless him. A few weeks later, I received a letter, a registered letter, indicating that the house was going up for sheriff sale. On the courthouse steps, a man had filed a $12,000 lien against the property because the previous owner owed him that money. And if I did not come up with $12,000 in 30 days, he was going to sell the house to the highest bidder. I called this man and said, Mr. My name is Les Brown. I purchased this house. I had nothing to do with your prior bill. Prior, prior bill, bill. He said, that's not my problem. He said, you should have had a title search. I said, can you give me time? I said, my mother is an older lady. She has a bad heart. And she, I said, please. I said, if you just give me the time, I don't know how I'm going to do it with the house note and everything else, but I think I can pay you at least $2,000 a month. And within six months, somehow I will pay you your money. He said, no, I want it all in 30 days or you get out. I do, did everything I could. Racked my mind thinking about how I could get $12,000 because I, I took everything I could to get the money just for the down payment and the closing. I finally had to face the reality that I wasn't going to be able to do it. I was up around 2 o'clock in the morning walking back and forth thinking, how was I going to tell my mother this? My children were there in the room sleeping all night long. I agonized over this. I lost over 23 pounds. Pretty soon I went in the room where my mother was sleeping and I said, Mama, I got down on my knees by the bed. I said, Mama, I got to talk to you. And she said, what's wrong? I said, Mama, I said, we got to get out the house. I said, in my haste to buy the house, I made a mistake. She said, that's all right, baby. I didn't like this house anyhow. <laughs> I said, Mama, you told me you loved it. I brought our friends out here to see it. She said, you know I have arthritis in my knees, and I don't like going up the steps, but I knew it made you happy. You loved it so much. I said, Mama, I've lost 23 pounds agonizing over this. Well, we had to pack up and go back to the old house down the street from Northwestern High School in Liberty City. All those neighbors who came out and saw us leave, those neighbors were there as we were coming back. We went in the house, the roaches were playing cards saying, come on in and take a hand. I was wiped out. I was embarrassed and humiliated. Words cannot encompass the symbolism of what I felt. I remember when I was unloading the furniture and I, I began to cry. My sister came by. Hmm. You know you didn't have any money to buy no house, Mr. Big Time. Hadn't given me a quarter. You know mama got a bad heart now, y'all, back where you belong. As I was crying and my head down, taking furniture in, my mama said, hold your head up. I said, mama, I said, I, said, I just feel so bad about this, mama. She said, hold your head up and dry your tears. You have nothing to be ashamed of. And I did. Now we could talk of the wealth of experience, the wealth of friends, the wealth of love, the wealth of family the wealth of culture, wealth of many kinds. However, in this program, we are more specifically going to talk about wealth in the sense of financial freedom. Wealth that comes from the conversion of effort and enterprise into currency and equity. For each of us, the amount of money required to be wealthy will differ. But the dream for all of us, I'm sure, is the same. Freedom from financial pressure, more freedom of choice, freedom to enjoy, and the opportunity to create and to share. Wealth. The possession of great financial resources that improves the quality of your life and gives you added dignity and expanded lifestyle. So decide for yourself, 
what wealth means to you. Latch on to your own mental image of wealth, and let's see if the ideas I'm about to bring to you will make sense, and perhaps provide you with the inspiration to put the plan into high action, so that as the days pass, you will discover a growing sense of freedom and dignity, self-worth, substance, and lifestyle. Elijah's in the cave. Now let me tell you something that's amazing. I, uh, I, I realized something. Nobody saw him under the juniper tree, and nobody saw him in the cave. The last time he was in public was on Mount Carmel, and on Mount Carmel, he was Superman. So everybody thinks he's Superman. Only God knows that he's Clark Kent. Isn't it funny how everybody can think you're better than you are, stronger than you are? Oh, you know, when you're good at what you do, people use you almost abuse you, which is really a compliment because they can count on you. They don't think that you're human. Oh, Mary's just always nice. Oh, Frida's just always good at her job. Oh, Pastor Thorns is just always, he's just amazing. He's amazing. Her is just amazing. He's amazing. I just went to First Central and oh, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Well, they see you on Mount Carmel. Nobody knows about your juniper trees and your caves. Nobody sees your secret places of frustration but God. And he's up under the juniper tree. And I think, you know, sometimes I think you ought to take a moment and just thank God that he gives you privacy with your pain. A luxury you will not have if you continue to succeed, I might add. Because the benchmark of when you really go mainstream, the hardest thing to have is privacy with your pain. So while you're fighting to be discovered and fighting to be exposed, be careful. Because once that light hits you, it don't just show your caramel, your Mount Carmel. It shines right up under your juniper tree and right into your cave and into your kids' caves. <laughs> Be careful what you're asking. You might get it. If you have nothing, I live in Fiji, of course, for time. I have a home there, resort there, and the families and villages there that I interact with the last 25 years. When you go to Fiji, you walk down the street, you drive by, and people jump up and they yell, Bula, 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 which means welcome, be happy, we love you. And you drive by five minutes later and they jump up, bula, bula, bula. And you're going like, what drugs are they taking? No one's paying them, but they're just, they're so happy. They're in such a different state. They've learned to focus on something else and come up with a different meaning for life. But if the meaning is it's the end, if the meaning is that you're dissing me, if the meaning is you don't care, whatever meaning we come up with, that affects the third decision, which is what am I gonna do? And what people do is based on the meaning, because the meaning creates emotion, right? You can be miserable no matter what you have, and you can be euphoric having nothing. We all know it's true. In fact, is it possible to learn to let, for example, all hell could be breaking loose around you, and you could just be sitting in a chair in this centered space, all hell breaking loose, and you could still feel great? Is that possible, yes or no? Yes or no? Sure, but you and I live in a Western culture where if you sit and bliss out, people come and take your furniture. <laughs> Knowledge equals execution and speed. I don't run 24 hour days. I haven't done, I don't even think that way. Does that help you? Yes or no? It's a total difference. Next thing you need to do, you need to stop negotiating the price tag in your life. Here's the fact. I'll give you the facts, okay? The fact of the matter is, is that when I was struggling, I was constantly negotiating whether it was worth it. Is it worth it? I'm away from my family. It's costing me money. I had to come to this seminar. Is it when you're negotiating the price you're paying all the time? Does that sound familiar to you, yes or no? Or the people around you are negotiating the price you're paying all the time. When I was poor and broke, when I would walk into a store, we all relate to this, I didn't look at what I wanted, I looked at price tags. I flipped them up, what's it cost? What's it cost? What's it cost? What's it cost? I can get that one. What's it cost? What's it cost? When I looked at a menu, what's it cost? What's it cost? I'll get that. People who come from scarcity and are poor thinkers are constantly negotiating price. Wealthy people well, there's a thin veil. They negotiate worth. There's a difference between cost and worth. Is what I'm doing worth it? Is what I'm doing worth it? Not what's it costing me? In fact, the price you will pay for not winning is infinitely greater the rest of your life than the price you will ever pay to win. But you're negotiating it too often vacillating. It takes your energy. It strips your focus. For most people, their will to win is for sale. For most people with enough failure, enough setbacks, enough adversity, you can buy them. They will relent. They will sell their dream. They'll sell their kids. They'll sell their future. This is the truth. You remember I said this to you because you're going to face this moment. There's going to be a point in time in your life where what you know is not enough. And if you're me, when I arrive at those points, I got to find something higher than me to pull me through. That's me. How many of you would consider yourself, ah, I should ask you that. If you consider yourself a person of faith, you relate to what I'm talking about. You will eventually in your life arrive at a point where all your preparation, all your knowledge will not be enough. And you're going to have to rely on your faith and the decision you've made where you've negotiated the price in advance before it hits. Because for most people, enough of that, they'll relent. Yeah, it just wasn't for me.
Yeah, it's just, you know, the industry, the market changed, interest rates went up. You know, we went into that market where just everybody was getting their butt handed to them. You know, I learned all this stuff, just the timing was right. Or, you know, you don't know about where I live. Where we live, this stuff doesn't.